Welcome to the University of Houston. Thank you for coming to our first lecture in the Fall 2012 Friends of NSM Distinguished Lecture Series. I am Randy Lee, Associate Dean for Research in the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. I would first like to say a few words about the Friends of NSM Lectures. This is a new initiative for our college that seeks to engage the community and reveal how science plays an important role in many aspects of our lives. As this series continues, I ask you to please join us again on October 23rd and November 27th for the following lectures. On October 23rd, Predicting Heart Attack Risk, and on November 27th, Regenerating Damaged Heart Muscle. I note also that the lecture series in 2013 will focus on topics in energy. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Yannick Gustafsson. Dr. Gustafsson is the Welch, Robert A. Welch Professor of Chemistry and the Director of the University of Houston Center for Neural Receptors, Nuclear Receptors and Cell Signaling, which is part of the Department of Biology and Biochemistry. He leads a research team focused on developing new treatments for an array of conditions including cancer, diabetes, obesity, and degenerative neurologic diseases. His current efforts build on the success of his research while at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Gustafsson joined the University of Houston in 2009, opening the center as a new initiative in the University of Houston's biomedical research efforts. The center has close research ties and ongoing collaborations with the Karolinska Institute and collaborates with many other institutions, including the Methodist Hospital Research Institute and the Institute of Biosciences and Technology at the Texas A&M Health Science Center here in Houston. Dr. Gustafsson is well known for the 1995 discovery that there are two estrogen receptors instead of one. The discovery of estrogen receptor beta was a transformative step forward in understanding estrogen signaling because the two estrogen receptors elicit different and sometimes opposite actions. Much of his work today is focused on the potential for medicines, anti-cancer agents, that utilize the favorable effects of estrogen receptor beta. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gustafsson as he discusses tonight the role of hormones in health and disease. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dr. Lee. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And I will try this evening to discuss with you some aspects of uh, hormones. And I'll uh, <coughs> try to make it understandable also for people who are not necessarily uh, experts in endocrinology, which means the um, uh, teaching of um, hormones. So um, uh, I'm going to tell you today uh, an incredible, to me, story of scientific discovery that has affected the lives of me and my uh, collaborators. And we already heard some of it from Dr. Lee. So it continues to be an exciting journey which brought me actually from the other part of the globe, Stockholm, shown here, a little bit in dark, where I spent the first 65 years of my life, to my new hometown, place of immense heat and fantastic thunderstorms. <laughs> and also, uh, this is uh, part of the South Campus, which I helped to build up in Stockholm. And it was very nice to move here to uh, our center, which is part of the CERC building, which has been uh, created by many people, including uh, President Katur. And uh, also the change has been quite dramatic. This is the way we live in Europe, um, and um, relax at least in summertime. And then uh, this is a tough life here on the prairie. So we have today, we'll have an update of estrogen signaling in the 21st uh, century. How far we have come and how far we have to go. So the discovery I'm going to tell you about, you already heard about it, occurred in our lab in 1995. 
and it's the discovery of the second estrogen receptor now called ER beta. And this represents about half of what we are doing. We are also working on some other receptors, but I will not talk about that tonight. I'll concentrate on estrogens. So when we discovered ER beta, <coughs> we were in fact looking for an androgen receptor, which is a receptor for male sex hormones. We were hoping that a second androgen receptor would help us understand the mysterious regulation of prostatic growth, which is a problem. You know that prostatic cancer is a very major disease affecting many males, in the same way as breast cancer affects females. We found the second estrogen receptor, a bit surprisingly, and it turned out to be even more interesting than a second androgen receptor. Since the human genome, the human DNA, is now known, we know that it is, there is in fact no second androgen receptor. So this is kind of interesting and can lead to some reflections. Here you have a typical scientist looking in this case for the androgen receptor in the prostate uh, and he's filled with various preconceived notions but it turned out that actually it ended up with ER beta. So what do we learn from that? So the first message I want to make is that discovery does not come by design but through creativity and an open mind. You can sort of plan everything. If you plan everything, it's not really good research. You don't need to do research if you can predict everything. The answers to our most profound questions are here staring at us in the face. We just have to know how to recognize them. And that's part, I think, of the excitement of science. It is when you find surprising things and you dare to believe in them. Estrogen, may, which is a female sex hormone, although it actually is very important even in males, is essential for life and without it the species would not be able to reproduce itself. So it may not surprise you that estrogen is essential, as I said, both in men and women for the maintenance of many parts of the body. And this shows you a little bit uh, schematically how the estrogen receptors are present in various parts of the body. And you could simplify it by saying that estrogen is two-faced. It has a good side and a bad side. And uh, the way I'm going to simplify it tonight is that ER beta usually mediates the good effects of estrogens and ER alpha the bad effects. You could see here that there are two receptors, the two receptors in the central nervous system and they actually have different distribution in different parts of the brain. And in the gastrointestinal tract, there is only ER beta, etc. We'll go through some of this. The big debate is whether estrogen should be replaced in women when the ovaries cease to function. That's one very, very important question. Exposure to estrogen, and that's the problem, is associated with the development of cancer of the breast and endometrium, which is part of the uterus. But loss of estrogen at the menopause is associated with many bad things. The unpleasant symptoms of vaginal atrophy, cognitive decline, you think less well, depression, hearing loss, cardiovascular disturbances, hot flashes, night sweats, increased risks of uh, heart disease and atherosclerosis, and uh, uh, one of the major problems is osteoporosis. So all of these problems come in women when the ovaries cease to produce estrogens. And one of the big um, sort of questions of medicine and gynecology is how can we help women to have sort of a better quality of life, particularly now when people live longer periods of time. So there are many decades when women have this problem. So why don't we know how to safely replace estrogen? Well, there is ignorance about estrogen signaling still today. We have come some, a little bit, but much more needs to be done. Ignorance about the normal postmenopausal breast. Well, ignorance, don't be shocked. Scientists are only human. And there's a lot of ignorance sort of in our community. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to do science to find new things. Although scientists are thinkers whose views are based on experimental evidence, after a while we do begin to believe in ourselves and in our own hypotheses. 
And this is a danger, particularly when you age as a scientist, that you get stuck and you have difficulties to think new things. That's why it's good also to have lots of, of young scientists who could point out to aging scientists that they may be wrong. So this is a little bit of the history of estrogens. Estrogen was discovered in the 1920s. Diethylstilbestrol, a very dangerous estrogen, uh, which was misused in medicine, was discovered during the, th or was synthesized during the 30s. Primarin, which is used in this country uh, as a hormone replacement therapy. It is actually <coughs> comes from pregnant mare's urine and it's still uh, an important medicine in, in gynecology. Estrogen receptor, the first one, was discovered by Elwood Johnson in 58. An old friend of mine, he's in his 90s now. Tamoxifen, an anti-estrogen, was approved for treatment of breast cancer during the 60s and 70s. Estrogen receptor beta, discovered by our group. And then uh, another important aspect is the Women's Health Initiative study raises questions about hormone replacement safety. And this has been debated a lot over the recent decade or so. This showed actually that there is a danger to use uh, Primarin. And uh, women can uh, have a higher risk of uh, breast cancer and also higher risk of cardiovascular disease. But it turned out that this study was not done so well. It was done in, in aging women. 10 years after menopause, in their 60s. And so it's been a lot, it's been criticized, and it turns out that many of these problems actually don't exist when uh, women uh, start to use estrogens at the age of about 51, which is the average age for the menopause. But it actually uh, affected Wyeth so that they almost went out of business and were bought up by Pfizer. This was this uh, faulty study, the WHI study, because the use of Primarin dropped to 50%, which means that many women today are not having the medicine they need uh, to have a, a good quality of life. Anyway, this shows you how the two estrogen receptors look like <coughs> in the biochemical sense. These are sort of a sequence of amino acids. You could see that the alpha is encoded uh, by chromosome 6 in humans and the ER beta by chromosome 14. So by definitely by different uh, genes. And you could see that the estrogen receptor beta is a little bit smaller than ER alpha. What, and you could also see these are the different domains of the receptors. And this is the ligand binding domain, E, which is very important because this is where the estrogens bind. Of course, the real receptor, as we shall see, uh, looks not like a, th a line like this, but it's much more convoluted. But the ligand binding domain is 59% similar between the two receptors, and that is enough to make it possible to synthesize ER beta-specific ligands and ER alpha-specific ligands. And you will soon see why drug companies are very interested in ER beta specific ligands. So ligands are compounds which bind to these receptors. When ER beta was discovered, many prominent estrogen experts did not believe, quote unquote, it could be important. Because of course they had dominated the field for a long time and here suddenly something new came up and then this mechanism kicks in about disbelief. So some people said it was a vestigial receptor, not so important. But uh, in 13 years after the discovery, one prominent lab was saying this, one of our competitors uh, in Europe, ER beta is not required in the mouse for the development and homeostasis of the major body systems. And I'll try to explain to you how they came to this erroneous conclusion. And they have also changed their mind recently. But this is important because it brings me to my second message. Please expect to meet opposition from the establishment when you make a discovery. And discovery can actually negatively affect your funding opportunities, believe it or not. And many people know that when you apply at NIH, the safe thing is to stick to the common theories. If you have two new theories, 
then you have a big chance to be rejected. What is estrogen? Well, everyone knows that estrogen or female sex hormone, which is called, it's a misnomer because it exists also in males, is a female sex hormone. <coughs> but do you know that male sex behavior, for instance, is determined during embryonic development by estrogen's effect on the developing brain? So this is very paradoxical. And you could see here, uh, these are <coughs> two estrogens. And you could see this is called ring A, because there are A, B, C, and D. And ring A here is aromatic with double bonds. And this is typical of the estrogens. You could see one very important aspect here. Testosterone, which is the major male sex hormone, is aromatized, as it's called. It's converted to estrogens, which again is interesting to keep in mind. <coughs> Estrogen is manufactured mainly in the ovaries, in women, by developing egg follicles. But it's also th synthesized in the testes of men. And when the ovaries cease to function at the menopause, an estrogen deficiency state occurs. And all healthy women who become older than 51 years or so have this problem of estrogen deficiency. So this is the way it looks like in a fertile woman during the uh, menstrual cycle. This is the level of estrogens. This is the first part of the menstrual cycle, a high peak, and this is the second part, which is a little bit more blunted peak. There are huge variations between different uh, women. And um, um, you could see also there is also an, an, a, a risk factor in estrogens for development of breast cancer although estrogens are necessary, of course, for fertility. Nevertheless, it can be dangerous. So, what was going on here? How could we understand estrogen action when we only had half of the story before we saw the second estrogen receptor, which has changed the field? Well, for 30 years, clinicians were using estrogens as drugs. And we thought there was only one estrogen receptor mediating both the good and the bad effects of estrogen. We now know that the good effects and the bad effects are mediated by two distinct receptors. And that, of course, leads to many possibilities in terms of drug development. And uh, this is also shown here. The two receptors are not exactly friends. They are often, uh, they, one can describe it as a yin-yang relationship. So ER beta in the cancer context is pro-proliferative. It enhances cancer development, for instance, in the breast, in the uterus. ER beta is anti-proliferative, anti-carcinogenic, and actually uh, is a very interesting target for development of anti-cancer drugs. And we and others have studied intensely the mechanisms behind these opposing effects. But before ER beta, we could not understand why, and this was, like I said, then, uh, before 1995, 96, some estrogens, phytoestrogens from plants, were good for the health and prevented cancer. And some estrogens were bad and were associated with increased risk of cancer. We understand it today, but not before. Some diseases were caused when estrogen levels were high, like lupus is a disease, and some by loss of estrogen, rheumatoid arthritis, dry mouth, vaginal atrophy, cardiovascular symptoms like hot flushes and night sweats. Some brain regions were estrogen dependent but did not express ER alpha, a big question uh, several, some years ago. The prostate was estrogen responsive but did not express ER alpha. And estrogen has, as I said, both good and deleterious effects on the body. So the existence of a second estrogen receptor, one could have thought would have been predicted, but nobody really predicted it uh, until it was really discovered. So first let us look at estrogen signaling, then we look at the normal postmenopausal breast, and then we look at estrogen signaling in breast cancer. Again, before ER beta, it was well known that ER alpha was highly expressed in some breast cancers called ER positive, but they are really ER alpha positive. And we could use tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen, to inhibit ER alpha dependent cancer growth. 
and tamoxifen has prolonged the lives of many breast cancer patients. The idea was to inhibit the bad guy, and this is still true today. After ER beta, because the inhibitor tamoxifen can inhibit both the good guy, ER beta, and the bad guy, ER alpha, we now have an alternative plan for treatment of breast cancer. And the new concept is to stimulate ER beta. And this would change the balance between the good and the bad. So the ratio between ER beta and ER alpha is extremely important. And we can affect it in various ways. <coughs> this is a simplified cartoon as the mechanism of action of the whole family of receptors called nuclear receptors to which estrogen receptors belong. So this is a cell and these are uh, low molecular compounds like phytoestrogens, drugs, uh, nutrients and they go here uh, over the cytoplasm into the nucleus where as the name implies the nuclear receptors are. And what happens is that these uh, drugs, or ligands as they are called, they bind to these nuclear receptors, as uh, shown here. And then these nuclear receptors, they dimerize, which means that they form a complex two and two. And they settle down on parking places, if you wish, on DNA, or response elements. And this leads to uh, an, an, an enhanced reading of the DNA into messenger RNA, or tr it's called transcription. And you can get more or less transcription, and this means you get more or less protein, and this leads to a changed cell function. So this is actually a very simplified cartoon, but this is the way estrogens act also. And I'll show you uh, soon here a little video uh, which I hope will convey to you a feeling for the mechanisms involved. And what we are going to discuss is how do the two estrogen receptors work? And that would be great if I convey that to you. Both estrogen receptors are proteins of molecular mass 60,000 Daltons. This means that they are quite big proteins. Estradiol the ligand, uh, or the hormone, has a molecular mass of 300 Daltons. So it's much smaller than these big estrogen receptors. So how does such a small molecule alter the function of such a big molecule in such a specific way? That's really uh, a central issue for tonight's lecture. Well, one estrogen molecule changes the shape of the receptor so that it can turn on the transcription of genes. Because, as I indicated to you, this is very central in the mechanism of action of nuclear receptors, including estrogen receptors. The mechanism behind this miracle was solved in the 1980s and 1990s, when genes were cloned and the structure of their products or proteins resolved. And now, if everything works, and it should, I'm going to show you this little video. Yes. So here we have, I'm just looking at the ligand binding domain now. And these are uh, a dimer of two ligand binding domains. And you see in here, in the proteins, embedded completely are the two ligands. These are the estrogen molecules, estradiol 17 beta or estrogen. And you could see how how uh, cozily they rest here in the interior of the receptor. Here are a ligand binding domain dimer with estradiol bound. And you see this is another way to <coughs> represent what goes on. And you see this yellow thing here, so-called beta sheets. This is the floor of the cavity where the uh, estrogen molecule sits. <coughs> And uh, I will try to explain to you now how anti-estrogens work. And you could see, again, this is the floor and this is the roof. This looks uh, very red here and aggressive. This is the helix 12, it's called. It's the roof of uh, the ligand binding cavity. And it's very, very important in mechanism of action of uh, estrogens. 
and also of other ligands for nuclear receptors. And we are going to look at this in some detail. Uh, <coughs> now, for a while we are looking now uh, and comparing estrogen. This is the way estrogen looks like. And I can tell you, I'm soon going to show you how an anti-estrogen looks like. So this is estrogen which is binding to certain amino acids in the ligand binding cavity. Now, uh, um, let's see, this is a space in the ligand pocket. And, and the estrogen lies here uh, in a very defined pocket in the ligand binding cavity. So how do we do now if we are doing, uh, making an anti-estrogen? Look, this is what happens. We have a side chain, it's called here, in raloxifene, which is a very well-known anti-estrogen. And the way it is different mainly from estradiol in blue is this enormous side chain which sort of comes up like this. And you will soon see why this is so important and why this will disturb the receptor's action. So now we go back to the structure. You will remember helix 12. And here you see this side chain. It actually boxes away helix 12. Helix 12 gets another position. This is very important. And I will try to ex explain to you why this is so important. But first, that you see, it's really quite simple. This uh, side chain changes the position. You see here, this is estradiol and this is anti-estradiol. Estradiol, anti-estradiol. So this is the mechanism, the simple mechanism between anti-hormones and real hormones. And I'll try to explain to you why this is so important. And this is true for many nuclear receptors. Okay, so these are nuclear receptors, as you see the dimer, two of them, and this is the basal transcriptional machinery, important for the transcription or the reading of DNA into messenger RNA. But today, since several years actually, uh, we have learned that there are many, many, many proteins participating in the mechanism of action of estrogen receptors. And here they are. And uh, we who are interested in this field spend every day looking at these various proteins <laughs> and the way they can affect uh, the nuclear receptors. And particularly important here is, are the so-called co-activators. And some of them are sh shown here. And one of them is called SRC1. And it was actually cloned and discovered by a well-renowned scientist in Houston, Bert O'Malley at Baylor. Some of his collaborators are here tonight. And it is actually the binding of this co-activator which is affected by anti-estrogens. So um, this is something that <coughs> needs to be disc uh, the, the, or discussed a little bit, what happens. And uh, this is uh, the way uh, um, chromosomes look like. And they, are, they consist of chromatin. There are two types of chromatin. Heterochromatin, which is silent. And uh, here the genes are silent. And you see these uh, globes. They are histones, very important proteins. And this, what go, is sort of wound around the histones, is DNA. And this is euchromatin, active chromatin. And this is the way the chromatin needs to look like when transcription factors are going to uh, transcribe the genes. And this is what the co-activators do. So this is one way to explain <coughs> the difference between the active chromatin, euchromatin, and the inactive chromatin, the dense chromatin. And I'm just going to discuss one aspect, and this is, you see, these AC means acetyl groups. And these acetyl groups uh, sit on histones, uh, actually. And they re uh, uh, actually repel each other. So that means the, the chromatin structure becomes open. And the co-activators, some of them are acetylases, which actually acetylate histones. And that is what the nuclear receptors do. So they open up chromatin so that transcription can take place. And uh, 
this is one way to explain it and to sort of tie back to the little video I showed you. So again, agonist means that there's something that affects the genes positively, like estradiol. And you will remember that I talked a lot about helix 12. And this is the way it is then in the receptor. And then um, actually the, this is part of the coactivator. And all coactivators, has a, they have a little foot, which is leucine, and then XX can be other amino acids, leucine, leucine. And the little foot is put down here in a crevice on the uh, receptor. And then this sort of leads to this complicated machinery of transcription. Now, what is an antagonist? I already showed to you that what the antagonist does with a side chain is to move helix 12 into another part of the receptor surface. And it, what happens is that helix 12 is bold enough to move exactly into the crevice here, which sort of is intended for the coactivator. So the coactivator is very sad. It's sort of up here and it cannot find a place any longer on the receptor. So the receptor is dead. It can't, acti it can't, be activ it can't activate uh, transcription because the coactivator can't bind because helix 12 is in the way because the antagonist have pushed, has pushed helix 12 there. So this relatively simple mechanism of action is still true today for most uh, nuclear receptors. So that's the mechanism of tamoxifen, raloxifen, and many antagonists. So I hope my little film there made at least part of it clear. Okay, nice things about the beta. It is anti-proliferative, therefore may be used to treat cancer. It's expressed in the prostate, therefore may be used to treat prostate cancer. It is not expressed in the pituitary, therefore cannot cause chemical castration and will be safe to use in men. Uh, if you uh, use estradiol to treat prostate cancer, then uh, the pituitary is affected and a hormone called luteinizing hormone stops being secreted and then the testis sort of uh, doesn't produce androgens and this is chemical castration. But the beta ligands do not have that effect. It is not expressed in the endometrium, therefore will not cause endometrial growth. So ER beta specific ligands don't cause growth of the uterus, whereas uh, estradiol does when it binds to ER alpha. It is anti-inflammatory, which is a very important aspect of ER beta, therefore will be effective in modulating inflammatory disorders such as neurodegenerative diseases. That's one of the things we actually discussed today in a collaboration with the famous Stan Appel, who is uh, a master of ALS, a very feared uh, neurodegenerative disease. And um, actually, inflammatory action is very important in this disease and in Parkinson. And we are actually discussing the use in patients of ER beta ligands to decrease sort of, uh, or, or to, to try to treat these diseases. And prostatitis, a very um, aggressive inflammation uh, that some men have terrible trouble with. It inhibits vascular smooth proliferation, therefore will be useful in treatment of atherosclerosis. I will come back to that. So it's quite a menu here of effects that ER beta ligands have. Okay, ER beta knockout mice, or a little learning can be a dangerous thing. <coughs> when nuclear receptors were discovered, their response elements on DNA were also discovered. I will, I've already told you, I think, that um, the nuclear receptors have a DNA binding domain. They have anyway, and it binds to DNA. This is quite a big discovery. And we participated in this, believe it or not, uh, uh, towards the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, when we collaborated with a group <coughs> at UCSF in San Francisco. And it was quite exciting. We collaborated for three or four years and we sent this group, we worked then uh, mainly with a glucocorticoid receptor, which we had purified from rat liver. And everybody was interested in those days to understand how the receptors could interact with DNA, with genes. 
and nobody understood it. <coughs> and this group in UCSF, led by a well-known scientist called Keith Yamamoto, he didn't have the receptor, we had the receptor, but he had this gene that you could see here. This is a gene. This is a murine mammary tumor virus, which causes breast cancer in rodents. But it is actually uh, uh, activated by glucocorticoids. So we try to understand how is this gene activated by the glucocorticoid receptor? How does it bind? And as you could see here, our receptor so it rides on the DNA. This was the first demonstration of a response element on the, in the parking place. And this led to the whole molecular biology revolution sort of, of, of nuclear receptor understanding. So this is one example of DNA binding of receptors. But in 1997, our lab also participated in the discovery that estrogen receptors could influence transcription without binding directly to DNA. That is, without binding to hormone responsive elements. This was done actually in collaboration with a group again in San Francisco and this group under the um, leadership of the late John Baxter, my dear friend, and his second in command is Paul Webb, who is now active at Methodist. So we continue our collaboration. So uh, this shows to you <coughs> some of these mechanisms. And I hope I describe it uh, uh, relatively clearly so that it could be understood. So here the estrogen receptor binds to DNA. This is DNA. And you could see the dimer that I've been talking about. But there are also other modes that this is mainly ER alpha. ER beta likes to bind instead to another DNA binding protein. This is called SP1. And here is the estrogen receptor. So it can be active without itself binding to DNA. Or it can bind to AP1, which consists of two transcription factors, FOS and June. So this is uh, what appears to be important for ER beta. So it doesn't need to interact itself with um, DNA. So in 2010 we showed that when you examine the R-beta binding sites on DNA cell, very few are hormone responsive elements, but they are actually AP1 elements. So the two receptors have quite different mechanisms of action. Now the importance of finding of multiple mechanisms of action in R-beta was not fully appreciated and this led to some mistakes. So researchers thought for a while that if you remove the DBD from the receptor, the receptor would be inactivated, but this is not the case. So when knockout mice were created by removal of the R beta DBD, the mouse was almost normal because the receptor was still functional. And it's taken us some time to reveal this, but uh, it appears to be quite clear. So the, hence the misleading conclusion from some labs that the R-beta was non-functional. I think it's kind of interesting to give you a little bit uh, sort of insights into the frontier and some of the intense discussions we have where all people are not agreeing to start with. So I will show you now evidence that the R-beta is very functional in many organs in the body. Now, if you look at the normal postmenopausal breast, which of course is extremely important because it is often the site of breast cancer, which is a terrible disease, but uh, where many, many people, particularly in the medical center, are, are fighting against this disease. It was believed for a long time that after menopause, the alpha expression increased in the breast and that this increase predisposed to development of breast cancer. Not so. What we found is that this is uh, from a breast, and uh, this is actually a normal breast. We have been lucky to collaborate with a bold gynecologist in Sweden who were allowed by the patients, postmenopausal patients, to take quite big biopsies. So we had a unique collection of tissue. And you could see here ER alpha is brown uh, stain, very little ER alpha, completely contrary to what people believe, but a lot of ER beta. ER beta, the receptor which nobody knew existed until some years ago, is the dominant receptor in the breast. And of course of importance when you want to understand breast cancer. What about the ER expression in breast cancer? Well, this is the breast, 
and the bre there are different types of breast cancer. Here you have the ducts which, uh, through which the milk is coming and there is ductal cancer coming from the ducts. And then you have here the lobes or the lobules and they, they give rise to lobular cancer. Ductal cancer is the most common and the most well studied breast cancer. And what happens now when, when cancer exists? I, I'll just show you uh, one little piece of it. But this is the normal epithelium, the way it should look like, uh, milk producing cells. And then something terrible happens, which is called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So these nice epithelial cells are actually converted to mesenchymal cells. They look more like connective tissue. And this is sort of the first stage in cancer causation. And these are several biochemical changes that occur that we and others study as biomarkers of cancer development. Again, uh, if we look what happens in cancer development, the beta expression, this is normal breast, which I already mentioned. You have lots of beta. you see these dark stains. This is invasive ductal breast. You see, your beta has almost disappeared, which is bad news that the protector against cancer disappears during cancer development. So this is what happens when you look at the two receptors, and this is ER alpha, and the ductal carcinoma in situ, which means the cancer is in place, it hasn't spread. And you see ER alpha is present in invasive ductal cancer, uh, and there is not much ER alpha. ER beta, uh, a little bit similar, it seems to uh, actually disappear as the cancer develops. And uh, this is the way it looks like. ER alpha sort of can increase in ductal carcinoma in situ. And these are patients treated with tamoxifen. But then ER alpha goes down when the cancer becomes invasive. ER beta, you see that ER beta is the dominant receptor in normal tissue but then it disappears. So that's one of the problems we have to work with, how to induce ER-beta in the cancer tissue, because we know ER-beta is anti-carcinogenic. And I'll come back to that. <clears throat> One thing that we have noticed, which we are working hard with now, is that ER-beta is strongly expressed in invading cells in breast cancer. So this is cancer and lots of cells. And what you can see, even if you are not breast cancer experts, is that you have uh, lots of, of, of cells here which are not organized uh, in, in these uh, round circles which sort of are, are the ductules. And these are actually immune cells which invade the cancer and they are filled with ER beta. And we are very interested in this because it's obviously so that the immune system invades the cancer, tries to kill the cancer, but for some reason they can't kill the cancer. And we don't understand why, nobody does, but we are working hard to understand this because if we can do that, and if we can sort of activate the ER beta in the right way, maybe we can kill the cancer. So why is the ER beta lost as cancer progresses? We do not know yet. Perhaps the increase in the ER alpha expression confers a growth advantage, and most ER beta positive cells are lost. We are working hard with this, and the same thing you can actually see in other cancers where you have ER beta in the normal tissue, such as, as I will mention briefly, prostate cancer and colon cancer. So when, what happens then when we introduce ER beta into cancer cells? The cancer cells, they don't like ER beta. They throw out ER beta from the cell because ER beta tries to stop the cells from growing. So if we now uh, sort of <coughs> try to cheat a little bit, the cancer cell. We introduce with molecular biology tricks ER beta into the cells. Well, most cancer cell lines do not express ER beta because it's thrown out and there are various mechanisms of that, but they can be forced to do so when we put the ER beta DNA back. When we do this, the cells behave better, believe it or not. They stop proliferating and become more differentiated, which means they become more like normal tissue. So ER beta is good for you in this context. And I'll show you some experiments very briefly. So this, we have worked with T47D cells, which is uh, the name of 
cells originating from a human breast cancer. And then we have used techniques that are quite common now. We use so-called nude mice or immunocompromised mice where we can inject these cancer cells under the skin and then uh, you get these tumors developing. And then using molecular biology tricks we can express the R beta in the cancer and again the cancer almost disappears, at least it becomes much smaller. So R beta does a very good job in stopping the cancer growing. And what we have concluded is that the R beta expression inhibits breast tumor growth the R beta expression correlates with significant reduction of the vessels. For tumors to grow, they need to have oxygen coming to them in the form of vessels. And it seems that our sort of R beta, our quote unquote R beta, downregulates expression of several growth factors that contribute to the formation of vessels. So this is one of many mechanisms that we have found for ER beta action. But there are many other mechanisms because ER beta seems to affect many genes. There are a few words about anti-tumorigenic effects of ER beta in colorectal cancer cell lines. These are studies carried out by Dr. Cecilia Williams, who I believe is in the audience, and she is uh, um, a tenure-track assistant professor at our center. So um, you could see here that the intestinal tract expresses nuclear uh, ER beta. So the brown staining here is the ER beta and you could see duodenum, small intestine, large intestine, a rectum. Uh, so ER beta is very important in the whole intestinal tract. And you could speculate what it does there. I mentioned that phytoestrogens bind to ER beta. And that's one uh, thing that might happen when we eat uh, food, that um, food estrogens activate ER beta in the, um, in the intestine, and that's good for you. ER alpha is not present. You can see blue staining here, which is background, and there is no brown staining. <laughs> So uh, ER beta is the only receptor in the intestinal tract. And then uh, these experiments have been carried out then, and you see that we did the same trick using human colon cancer cells called SW480. And this is the size they have in the control experiments with the nude mice. And then when we tricked the cells to express ER beta, the tumors became much smaller. So it's the same story as with breast cancer. And I should also tell you that we are not alone in the world of seeing this. We have been first perhaps to show them, I like to believe, but many people have reproduced them afterwards. So there is no controversy here. And Cecilia was happy to have her results published in a well-respected uh, journal, actually created several years ago by Dr. Brad Thompson at our center, who is here tonight. He was the creator of molecular endocrinology, who is a very popular uh, uh, journal in this field. And they liked Cecilia's paper so much that they put her result on the front page. And this is the artist's view of the dimer. You remember that I said that two receptors like to be together. So here are the two ER betas riding on DNA. And then this means that they uh, actually negatively influence something called PROX1. This is a, an oncogene, a cancer gene, which is well known in colon cancer, and ER beta stops it. That's one of the many mechanisms. I think this is quite a nice uh, explanatory picture. Uh, this shows you uh, the cell cycle, <clears throat> so that when cells divide, it happens according to a special uh, type of a process called the cell cycle. And it's been very well studied, and many years ago, three, the three guys uh, actually uh, best on this field got the Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery of the cell cycle. And of course, extremely important to understand how cells divide in cancer. I'll just show you, th these are called Western blots, and this is the way you study proteins. And this is just to show you how ER beta affects the cell cycle regulation. And uh, obviously, uh, we don't need to go into all details. I just want to 
to, to tell you the principles. And uh, the, you have oncogenes which cause cancer, and you have tumor suppressor genes which suppress cancer. And this is the control, and this is the cells, SVU W480, where we have expressed the beta. And you see P21, a strong band here. This is a tumor suppressor gene. P27 is called so because it has a molecular weight of, of a 27K. It has a strong band if you compare to the control. And P53 is one of these. So you have three examples where ER beta turns on tumor suppressor genes or proteins which uh, actually combat the cancer. So again, you can see there are many, many mechanisms all pointing in the same direction. Cancer control, cancer prevention. What about the beta in the prostate? So we have prostate cancer, which as I already mentioned, is a big problem for us men. And many, many people die of prostate cancer. And we are seeking uh, treatment of prostate cancer. So this is the way they develop. You can see this is a nice prostate with small glands. And then everything becomes more and more terrible here as the cancer develops. And there is lack of glands and so on here. And one uses Gleason scale. And the higher the Gleason scale is 5, it's bad news. The lower it is, the better it is for you. So of course we have looked also here. This sh shows you incidentally how prostate cancer develops, and this could be true for other cancers. And this is the nice uh, prostate uh, epithelial cells. And you, you see that what happens when cancer develops is that these epithelial cells begin sort of to loosen from the environment, and they change, uh, uh, they change size and form. And then they can actually leave the epithelium and here is a, is a vessel, and they enter the vessel, uh, these uh, cancer cells, and it can settle down in the bone and form metastases. So this is one way to understand prostate cancer, but also many other cancers. So what have we learned about the beta from studies of prostate cancer? Well, the beta is lost in Gleason grades higher than 3 plus 3. Again, the same sad story that we have to fight against that when the cancer progresses and develops, then ER beta disappears. <coughs> so I'll show to you the same thing here. This is ER beta. Again, you will remember these brown dots. These are the cell nuclei stained for ER beta. We have been working hard to get good antibodies. And this is my partner, uh, Dr. Margaret Warner, who is here tonight also, who has spent a lot of time uh, making these techniques work. And not only that, she's also done a marvelous job on the mechanisms of action of ER beta and so on. And you see here also that uh, you have this phenomenon of the immune cells invading actually the cancer. And they stain very strongly for ER beta. And we, we really are excited about this because somehow the immune cells normally don't seem to be able to kill the cancer. They go there, but in some way the cancer controls the immune cells. But if we can find one way to activate the beta here, maybe we can help the immune cells to kill the cancer. That's one of the things we are working with. This is Gleason grade 4 plus 4, so the cancer is worse, the beta is gone, the androgen receptor is still there. Androgen receptor is very, very important in prostate cancer, but I am not talking about that tonight. This means that if we catch prostate cancer at Gleason grade 3 plus 3, when ER beta is still expressed, we can treat with ER beta agonists and avoid progression to higher grades. And this is one of our interests. And do we have an animal model to study prostatic disease? Well, the mouse is not so good, actually. But there is another rodent called a gerbil, which ha is a good model of prostate cancer. And one of our postdocs is Dr. Sabrina Rochelle Maya, who is here tonight and is at our center. She comes from Brazil, and she helped us to set up the gerbil model system, because that is what her lab had developed uh, in uh, Brazil. And this is normal prostatic epithelium. You see these ducts where you have the prostatic fluid uh, accumulating. And then you see this doesn't look so nice. And again, you have this inflammatory disease, 
which is typical of certain uh, cancer cancers. And um, so in the aging gerbil prostate, AR beta is lost, there is prostatitis, and prostate cancer develops spontaneously, which it doesn't do in the mouse. That's why the gerbil is better in this research than mouse. ER beta agonists have a spectacular effect that I'll show you on the prostate in rodents. So treatment of 1.5-year-old gerbils with an ER beta agonist LY321, this is from Eli Lilly. It's quite difficult to get good ER beta agonists because the drug companies like to keep them tight. But we have developed over the years a good relationship with some drug companies, including Eli Lilly, and they have given us this fantastic drug. And they are quite selective in giving it to us so, so we can uh, actually see many interesting results. In induction of ER beta, we can see a reduction of hyperplasia, which is when you have many cells, and elimination of immune cells. And I'm going to give you, give you one example. First, just to show you hyperplasia in 10-month-old dural prostate, you can see here that what should be only one layer of cells, it's a fantastic mess of cells. They are crawling on top of each other. And this is hyperplasia, which is a pre-stage of cancer. Now, look here. <coughs> These are 12-month-old gerbils treated with a vehicle here. So these are controls, and they look terrible. And uh, if you look uh, carefully, you can see prostatitis. You could see uh, uh, carcinoma and inflammation. And then we treat with this very specific, fantastic air beta agonist from Eli Lilly. And you see the prostates clear up and uh, the hyperplasia is gone, inflammation is gone, etc. You can imagine how much we would like to treat patients with this to see if it has an effect against prostatitis and prostate cancer. And this is one of the things we are working with. That's one of the reasons why we like so much to be in Houston, that you have this fantastic medical center where you could find experts in all diseases. And we are trying to set up contacts so we can actually uh, see whether we can help patients, uh, particularly cancer patients, to, to treat with the beta agonists. This is something, autophagy in the epithelium of the oral prostate after three days of treatment, this special type of <coughs> destruction of cells where they die and new cells come instead. It's a process which is studied very intensely today. And autophagy is uh, actually stimulated by ER beta. The good news is that ER beta agonists increase ER beta expression. So this is the control, and this is a normal prostate. And you could see here that ER beta uh, actual expression, or these are quite old animals, is induced by ER. So by giving the ER beta ligand, you can express ER beta, which is good news. Since the bad news is that ER beta disappears as the cancer progresses. So this means that the ER beta agonists can be used in later stages of cancer when the ER beta is lost because they can restore ER beta expression. Okay, ER beta and prostatitis. As we have seen, ER beta is expressed in immune cells. ER beta agonists are anti-inflammatory in the prostate, and this may have immediate use in the treatment of prostatitis. Prostatitis is very common, painful inflammation of the prostate. If you talk to males who've had this, you can understand how they suffer, and there is no good treatment. One is so-called prostate massage, which is terribly painful. So if we can find a way to treat uh, with the arbeta agonists, many males will be very thankful. So this is, again, untreated gerbil prostate, uh, 13 months, and it looks terrible. The cells grow on top of each other, etc. They look a little bit better here, and we have found here a new uh, effect of ER beta, vasodilation. So it appears that ER beta can actually increase sort of the lumen of the vessels and in that way affect blood pressure. So that's another uh, actually finding. So in addition, the vasodilation may explain our early observation that ER beta regulates blood pressure and suggests that the ER beta agonists may be used to treat hypertension. And this was a paper in Science some years ago, and this shows that uh, uh, this is high blood pressure when you knock out the ER beta, and this is from the controls. 
So this is again uh, one other thing that you could use ER beta ligands to treat. And the good news is that when, because people have obtained in certain clinical trials ER beta agonists and they don't seem to have any toxic effects. So it's quite um, attractive drugs. One of the main reasons is that ER beta regulates a peptide called calcitonin gene related peptide, which is a potent vasodilator secreted from nerve terminals. This is work carried out by Chiara Gabi, who is assistant professor at our center. So I mean, there's a big menu of things that ER beta does. And it shouldn't actually surprise us because estrogens and estrogen receptors are sort of, they have been around for a long time. Some paper in Science some time ago suggested that the first steroid receptors that were formed during evolution were estrogen receptors, which could perhaps uh, explain why they have retained so many functions, why they are so important. And you can understand then how women might suffer from losing estrogen after the menopause and how important it is to help them, to give them good hormone replacement therapy. And we think ER beta is. I will soon stop. I notice that time has flown away. Uh, ER beta and restenosis is another. This is a disease which happens after treatment for atherosclerosis when you have burst open the plaque. Um, then uh, sometimes these patients get um, actually uh, the, the, the smooth muscle cells start to proliferate and then again uh, the blood flow is stopped. But it appears that ER beta agonists can be used to prevent restenosis because again they stop proliferation, the same story, but in this case it is from uh, they stop proliferation in, in the smooth muscle cells. I will uh, soon end. Uh, I, don't, I think I will skip this in, in the interest of time and maybe you have some questions. But I just will mention briefly that uh, ER beta seems to be also something that could help in depression. You probably know many of you because you'll probably experience it if you're a woman after the menopause or in the menopause that one of the terrible symptoms of the menopause is depression, which can really make life terrible for you. And the, well, that's one of the reasons why women take hormone replacement therapy, because in many cases it helps them uh, uh, against depression. So I will just mention to you that it appears that the part of the brain where estrogen acts is called the rafa nucleus. It's in the middle of the brain. And there is estrogen receptor beta there. So this is actually one of the diseases where um, uh, drug companies hope to use their beta ligands. But I will skip this. Um, so I started off by telling you that it was an unbelievable story. And I hope that I conveyed to you the widespread role of estrogen in our bodies. Now the knowledge of two estrogen receptors helps us to benefit from the good effects of estrogen and avoid the bad effects. The dream of clinically useful ER beta selective ligands has come true. They are very safe drugs, as I indicated, and are being tested by several big pharma companies for use against the diseases that we predicted actually many years ago. This was a review we wrote in an endocrinological uh, 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 journal where we suggested the use of ER subtype selective agonists against many of these diseases I have discussed. So this is the future, novel ER beta ligands. This is the future in the estrogen field. There is no doubt about it. This is the last slide, just to summarize. So what do ER beta selective ligands do? And this is something that we would like to do in collaboration with clinicians <laughs> at the medical center, and like I said, we have started already and we have good collaboration with <coughs> um, actually drug companies. One is Eli Lilly and we are also making attempts to start, I set up actually in Sweden many years ago together with my deceased very good friend John Baxter, a company called Carobio, which is Karolinska Biotechnology Incorporated and it's been working with nuclear receptors. 
and we have convinced them that to have their cancer uh, uh, activities, anti-cancer activities, if possible here in Houston. So we have applied in secret for um, setting up a Carabio Texas. And if that uh, is funded, we hope that uh, together with this company, we could also uh, find uh, treatments, interesting treatments of cancer based on ER beta ligands. So just in summary, ER beta selective ligands <coughs> prevent postmenopausal depression, hot flashes and night sweats. And for women who have gone through this, they will tell you what hell they go through and how happy they would be if they didn't have these problems. Prevent proliferation and may be used to treat several forms of cancer. Promote breast health by opposing the proliferative effects of ER alpha. Our anti-inflammatory, uh, the ER beta ligands are anti-inflammatory and may be used to treat prostatitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and degenerative diseases of the central nervous system, such as multiple arthrosclerosis and ALS. And like I said, we had as late as just a few hours ago, fantastically uh, stimulating discussion with Stan Appel, head of neurology of Methodist. And ER beta protects also against, believe it or not, age-related hearing loss. And uh, uh, actually, if you knock out ER beta from mice, they uh, actually lose their hearing. And if you treat them with ER beta ligands, it takes a longer time for, uh, and also normal mice, I should say, lose hearing after a while. But you can uh, actually slow down that process by giving ER beta ligands. So you could see, not surprisingly, that ER beta has many, many effects. And what gives us hope that some of these diseases and the treatment of them will become a reality is like ER beta ligands appear to be non-toxic. Though when we have talked to companies who have made uh, large toxicology studies, they don't see any negative effects. It is almost too good to be true. But anyway, you can understand our enthusiasm and uh, how happy we are to, to be here at University of Houston, where uh, there are so many possibilities to interact. You have computer people, you have chemists, you have various people who could help you to develop these drugs further. And we have uh, also uh, all the medical uh, center where they have experts in all these diseases. So we look forward to another many years of exciting research. Thank you very much. I, I promised to show this to you that Dr. Lee already mentioned, but it's part of my task tonight to again make you enthusiastic about coming back October the 23rd when uh, Dr. Kakadiaris, who is a computer expert, will talk about improving prediction of heart attack risks. Yes, uh, so the question is, how can you promote the ER beta expression? And this is something we are working with, but the simple answer is that the ER beta ligands themselves, at least some of them, seem to induce estrogen receptor beta, which is counterintuitive because it is known that estrogens will downregulate ER alpha, but they seem to upregulate the ER beta. But there may be other mechanisms, and we should look at them too. That's clearly a very important question. Well, uh, actually, um, uh, let me answer the second question first. You are quite right that, that ER beta um, counteracts 
epithelial to mesenchymal transition. We have shown that, and other people have shown that. In fact, there was a paper a couple of years ago in cancer cell that, that, that showed this. And the, you, you have this effect on the two uh, cadherins, as you mentioned. That's absolutely uh, correct. What was the first question? It was... Oh, okay. Triple negative cancer. Yes, this is actually, it's interesting because triple negative cancer is uh, very much in the limelight. In fact, you may know that Ron De Pinho, the head of MD Anderson, a couple of days ago declared war against uh, certain forms of cancer. And when it came to breast cancer, it's a triple negative breast cancer, which means that they are negative for ER alpha, for HER2 and the progesterone receptor. And it turns out, as shown by, again by one of our scientists, uh, Dr. Christophorus Thomas, who is here tonight and is working with people at MD Anderson here, that a certain fraction of these patients actually do express ER beta. And uh, definitely that's uh, one of the breast cancer types where we can see a future use of ER beta ligands. So we are very interested in that. Thank you for that. Yes, I have one more question. Uh, okay, go ahead. ER beta mutation in the cancer patients? No. Uh, the question is, does ER, is ER beta mutated in cancer patients? The answer is no. And actually, um, this is a very interesting um, question, because uh, the same thing can be asked about ER alpha. But the interesting thing that there is only one patient who has ever been um, uh, found to have an ER alpha mutation. And this was a guy who had extreme insensitivity to estrogen, and it was published in a journal. That's the only one, probably reflecting the importance of ER alpha and of ER beta. We have really looked for ER beta mutations in cancer, in various other disease states, but haven't found it. And we take it as a sign of the physiological importance of these uh, receptors. As contrary to, for instance, the glucocorticoid receptor, where many mutations have been described affecting the glucocorticoid receptor function. 